Georgia had been this kind of like, I don't know if maybe I just watched a lot of movies as a kid and had this romantic <laughs> idea of the South. I'm what born, movie? What movie? I'm thinking of like Gone with the Wind. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, yes, I was, classic. Ra- yeah, I it's was, a classic. What's up, everybody? My name is Adam, and I'm the host of the You Know Adam Same podcast, the show that is dedicated on bringing on passionate people, learning about their stories, and delivering value to entrepreneurs. So if that's what you're interested in, go ahead and follow, like, and subscribe. You know what I'm saying? How's it going, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the You Know Adam Same podcast, where you get to know just a little bit more about people, passions, and all things business. Today, sitting across the way, I have Miss Vanessa Wagner from Georgia Power's Business and Community Development Center. Did I get that wrong? No, that's almost there. <laughs> I'm with Georgia Power Community and Economic Development. Fantastic. Welcome to the show. The question at hand is, what does Georgia Power have to do with entrepreneurship? That's a fair question. Okay. So for over 100 years, Georgia Power has actually worked on helping local communities grow. Mm. So we've been in the economic development space because when a community grows, whether it's here in Statesboro, Georgia, or where I live in Brunswick, Georgia, then our company grows as well. Absolutely. And that starts with everyone from our entrepreneurs and small business to our large industrial users. You, uh, you put that Perfectly. So I, I would like to know a little bit about, you know, how you got into that position and then kind of, you know, tips and tricks for entrepreneurs, if you will. So take me back, you know, how, uh, what is the journey look like? So I got into economic development by working on a farm of all wow. places. <laughs> so up in Northern Virginia. Um, what type of farm? So we were an agro-tourism destination. I actually managed one of the largest CSAs in the country at that time. CSAs? Community Supported Agriculture. Okay. Where community buys into a crop ahead of time. Okay. And then they get the bounty. Um, and so they share the risk, but also the rewards of a farm season. Okay. And you mentioned agro-tourism. Mm-hmm. So what is that? What does that mean? So that's really introducing the general community and educating folks about what agriculture is and how it's important. So inviting, you know, everything from a you pick experience to come out and pick berries or apples to interacting with the animals to learning about what pollinators are. So really just bringing people into what farming is all about and making it more accessible. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, take me back to kind of like, you know, yeah. what, 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 what specifically were you doing at that point? Yeah. How did I go from a farm into economic exactly, development? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so I, part of my role in, at the uh, farm I worked at, Great Country Farms up in Bluemont, Virginia, a um, lot of love to that family still, uh, is going out and doing presentations to let people know what CSAs were, what our product offerings were. And through that, I caught the eye of the local economic development agency because they're like, well, oh, sugar, that's kind of what we do. We go out and we present our community. We talk about the value. And so apparently I was good at selling CSAs where they brought me on to help build um, the tech ecosystem for Loudoun County, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So how does it translate farms to tech? Um, I My first blog I wrote in economic development was actually that was very similar. When I would have to wrangle uh, loose goats on the farm, it was almost like wrangling venture capitalists up in the DC metro. Love, the, <laughs> so, love that comparison. Yeah, you had to have something shiny to get their attention. <laughs> um, so, you know, well, it wasn't a be- you know, bell on the farm. At, working in economic development up in the tech ecosystem. It was, you know, the shiny new tech startup, the company that's building something and solving a problem that no one else was. Mm -hmm. And then so, you know, as you went through through this, like, how did you, what made you so good at that? Where, where some, like, you know, from someone from the development, uh, economic development center Mm -hmm. caught, like you caught their eye. Yeah. I think it's going to go to, I think what the point of your show is here is passion. Mm. You know, when I, what I realized is working in economic development is if you love your community, that's what you're selling and trying to help grow Mm -hmm. and grow it in a sustainable way. That's right. So it was that I cared about where I lived. I cared about the people, the businesses, and my mission was, hey, let's just help them. Mm -hmm. So it became, you know, the same way I loved farms and I love goats. You know, now I was just helping do the same thing for my community. Mm -hmm. And go ahead. And where did that lead you? So I continued on. I went from um, working on tech ecosystem building. So really helping, making sure that our local entrepreneurs and specifically tech startups had resources they needed, connecting to venture capital, to prep work, to mentors, to um, different kinds of grants and funding opportunities. And then I went into industrial development when I moved to Georgia. So very different. 
um, decided, you know, Georgia had been this kind of, like, I don't know if maybe I just watched a lot of movies as a kid and had this romantic <laughs> idea of the South. I'm what born, movie? What movie? I'm thinking of like Gone with the Wind. <laughs> No, I was yes, I was classic. raised. Yeah, I it's was, a classic. It is. I was raised in Buffalo, New York, born and raised. Okay. So I had no idea of like the South and these big. Anyway, uh-huh. so I had this romantic idea, and I always kept a LinkedIn alerts for opportunities. So something came up in Brunswick, working with their development authority. I hit the easy apply button, mm-hmm. and they. The next thing you know, two months later, I was packing up our entire house and family and life in Virginia, and had a U-Haul with my Subaru in tow, and. Started out doing industrial development for Brunswick Lynn County. And how was how was that? It was an experience, um, and I mean that uh, it was a learning experience for me. I went from the DC, went Buffalo, DC Metro to a smaller community in Georgia, and it was a big culture shock. Um, but again, it goes to those people. If you love the people and you love, you know, what you do is helping your community, mm-hmm. then you just keep continue working it and. You know, I didn't run home. I love, fell in love with I, my love of the South was confirmed. And so when an opportunity came to represent the entire state instead of just my little part of the world, that's where I took the position as a marketing program manager with Georgia Power Community and Economic Development. That's awesome. Yeah, during this period of time, I'm, I'm sure you, you know, experience a lot of entrepreneurs that come through kind of like that you speak with. Uh, one of the questions I have is, you know, there's uh, you, you, it seems like there is a larger metropolitan area in, up in D.C., and there's also somewhere like a little bit smaller that is like Brunswick. If you could put into your own words, like compare and contrast the two, like where do you think an entrepreneur would do better in? So I think it depends on the product, and I think it depends on where their customers are. Yeah. But that's one of my goals. So one of the pro- – um, one of my goals is to make sure that it doesn't matter where you're located, that you know the resources available to you. Mm-hmm. So it was during the pandemic, we saw a lot of our small businesses um, you know, going through a lot of challenges, whether it was keeping their doors open, finding customers. So Georgia Power Community and Economic Development, we decided we need to do something. And beforehand, our emphasis was really on working with our local communities as well as the larger businesses but we said these entrepreneurs need help. Mm-hmm. So we um, hatched a plan to launch a program called Grow Georgia. And Grow Georgia goes ahead and puts together all of the resources we can find specific to small businesses, but with an emphasis on our diverse founders and puts them in one place. Mm. So to answer that question you initially asked me, that w- that helps that even if you're in Statesboro or you're in Metter or wherever that might be, if you go to growgeorgia.com, you can find statewide resources so that you're not limited by what's in your own backyard. What, what, what type of resources are we talking about? Are we talking about funding? Are we talking about knowledge? What is it? What, what, what's out there? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, most entrepreneurs, that's one of the first questions they ask is, where can I find capital? I need a grant. I need a loan. Sure. That's certainly a big part of it. And so we do have those. Okay. Uh, again, with an emphasis on our diverse or minority-based founders. However... Once you get the money, do you know what to do with it? So we really make sure that we're putting in business education workshops in there. Wow. Whether it's partnering with the SBDC, SCORE mentors. Additionally, our Fortune 500s in Georgia, which we have, I think, 18 of them, they are desperately looking to partner with diverse founders and help with their supplier inclusion programs. So we're promoting all of those. So if you're, you know, if Georgia Power is looking to hire someone for catering or for social media services, you know, making sure that it's easy to find their supplier inclusion program, certifications so that you can qualify as a diverse business, Um, and then success stories. Mm. You know, I think that's part of it. It's, It's really hard if in your own backyard, you might not see someone that looks like you achieving, you know, what your dream is. So if we can put together those stories from across the state and shine a spotlight on them, it's that whole idea of if you can see it, you can be it. Mm-hmm. Um, with this, uh, you know, all these resources that are available, you know, this is actually my first time that I've heard about uh, this program. Um, how would you advise someone that maybe, you know, is has an idea right now um, how, like, what does that look like? Take me through that, I guess, journey. Yeah. 
So in, uh, if someone is just starting out an idea, you know, I think that's really that part of that learning, that product um, ideation and understanding if there's a market fit. Mm-hmm. So that's a great place to start with one of the, the sugar, I sh- wish I knew it top of my head, but the SBDC through University of Georgia has offices throughout the state mm-hmm. um, that are physical locations, or you can meet with anyone virtually. And if not with an SBDC, with a SCORE mentor, just to talk through it, like, hey, do you think this works? Is there an opportunity here? Those types of organizations like the SBDC can also provide an entrepreneur with market research, competitive analysis. They can help them start to understand those business plan ba- uh, basics. And I don't think every entrepreneur needs like a full 20 page business plan. That's when you're going to a bank and going for a loan. Sure. However, at least something scrappy like a you know a business model canvas or something to understand who those who your audience is, how you're going to reach them. So I think that's a great first step. Mm-hmm. Connecting with those folks that are there to help through that, getting your idea onto paper or at least you know onto a onto a scrapbook or something. <laughs> it doesn't have to be the full plan. Have you ever had um, any aspirations to do entrepreneurship yourself? Oh goodness, that is uh, that's one of yes. The answer Talk is to yes, me about that. of course. So I feel that there's so many opportunities out there. And, you know, I get that question a lot from businesses. Like, well, what should I start? Sure. And you do see those those opportunities. Um, at this point, though, and I I just feel like I'm in a position where I'm supposed to be serving others. Mm. So it's, I know all these resources. And it would be easy if I had a great idea for me to go tap into this network. But it's important to have people that are in roles like mine that want to be those connectors as well. Sure. And it sounds so cheesy to say, but I feel it's almost my calling yeah. <laughs> to be in a support role um, where right now I'm, I've been helping my husband with his ideas for a small business. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like I shouldn't say this on camera or on, on mic because uh, Adam, I was talking to you earlier and you had this great advice that said, like, just go out and do it. Don't plan it to death. Sure. At least start testing it out. Um, we're in a bit of a phase of planning it to death yeah. right now. Um, but it's his business. It's his baby. And, you know, I think that's sometimes the hardest part of being a supporter, whether it's someone you know or a business a client you're working with is is not pushing or being like, why aren't you just doing this? It has to be their journey. Uh, I'm sure you have some phenomenal stories of the various different businesses around Georgia. What comes to mind when I like, you know, what comes to mind when I ask you, like, what are some of those stories? Um, I recently did a story on Kevin Pollan, and he is a retired teacher and educator and a lifelong artist. And when I say lifelong, he, he started like in kindergarten with a pile of clay um, and loved that he could mold it into anything. Uh, right now, he's working on a project called The Colors Project, which is helping create experiences um, about the African-American and Gullah Geechee heritage but creating experiences that the entire community can come together for. Mm. So there's an artistic element to it. There's a storytelling, a historic moment. And, you know, when I first interviewed him and met him, I thought I was just going to do a piece about his sculptures. And really what I learned is through his business and the model he's trying to bring to life in Brunswick is he's building empathy and creating a more caring community. Within Um, within pottery. Yeah, within pottery and Uh just by this shared experience. Um, so he's currently just graduated from an accelerator program, and oh, wow. I can't wait to see what's next for him. That's awesome. Uh, what, what's another one that kind of like comes to mind? Well, then there are some of the big ones, and I know this is an entrepreneurship show, sure. but it's been really exciting. Um, the first project my um, I personally had the opportunity to work on with my team, state partners, and local communities was the Hyundai um, uh-huh. Meta Plan America project. Sure. And so seeing that come to life, you know, going from a hey, we're going to pitch this. We're, we're down to, you know. How early did us. you know about it? Not, it went really fast. It went super fast. <laughs> oh my and gosh. they're moving so fast out there. It's I don't know crazy. if you've ever driven by. So mo- in economic development, when you're working with larger, even sometimes a small to medium sized manufacturer, let's say 50 people or so, it can be a two year decision making process. Today, that's not the case. <laughs> These projects are happening in like six months. Sure. Um, and so that's why it's so important for communities to to be prepared for it, whether it's preparing their workforce and their talent, uh, making sure that they've got infrastructure in place, because these projects are coming and they're just happening so much. I mean, gosh, I've been in an economic development for almost a decade and I've never seen anything like this. 
For, uh, specifically the, the, the Hyundai plant. But yeah, but, but any of these larger projects, just the speed in, they're happening. Just mm-hmm. like super fast. Absolutely. What, what do we need to do as a community or as an entrepreneur or as a business owner to – because uh, you, you mentioned about the infrastructure. What do we need to do to adapt to this influx that is hap- is about to happen? So as entrepreneurs, I think one of the best things to get tapped into right now is looking at those supplier inclusion, inclusion programs, mm-hmm. um, you know, whether it's getting certified as a small, uh, a women-owned business, a minority-owned business, because everything from the Department of Transportation to large companies are looking to they, they have, yeah, they're looking and what, to partner. And what, what type of partnership is that? Is that just like anything? It, it can be anything from they need catering partners to they need, you know, somebody else to help with landscaping or construction or technical services, mm-hmm. you know, um, sp- cybersecurity or making sure that, you know, they're training their staff. So there's, I, I wish I could say there's one thing, but it's so broad right now. Mm-hmm. I would say, though, probably the most pressing opportunity that those big companies are struggling with is finding construction and and that type of labor (laughs) Um, because they want to work with small businesses. um, So that's definitely a huge opportunity right now. You think you think why do you think there's been such a uh, shortage? Right. Because, like, you know, I look at the market in Statesboro. I mean, of course, interest rates are kind of like starting to rise. Um, but you know, construction costs have also like just increased immensely. Is it just because there is so much construction happening at the plants that they've pulled all the teams to help over there? Or like, why do you think that's the case? I mean, that's a nationwide problem right now. I mean, a lot of it is, I feel like a broken record saying supply chain, but (laughs) a lot of it did during the pandemic. It hasn't um, hasn't corrected. It's doing, it's doing better. If you look at a lot of the improvements and, um, expansions that have happened at our inf- our transportation network, whether it's the Georgia Ports Authority has just been making tremendous investments mm-hmm. in helping reduce that timeline that it takes to get a, a ship in, unloaded, trucks out. So everyone's catching up, but that's really an, a national issue, a global issue, if you would. What do you see happening kind of moving forward into the future? Like, I mean, we're kind of like in this interesting period of time right now, right? Uh, I think the area may be... Uh, what I've been hearing is that it's, it's going to be bolstered by kind of like, like this plant moving in. Um, but what do you see kind of like overall for Georgia as a whole? Yeah. So um, let me take the first part. When I say about the region, one thing to keep in mind with manufacturers is it's very different. And that is we are seeing a ton of manufacturing projects right now. Um, I heard someone in my partners say it wonderfully a few weeks ago that it's almost like where Georgia's going through or the Southeast is going through an industrial revolution. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're seeing these big manufacturing projects coming in, but it's not manufacturing that was, you know, around the first industrial revolution of the sure, country. Sure. It, this is really high tech. Um, so anything that local communities can do to prepare their students, their existing workforce with new skills to meet the demands of these technology-based businesses and technology-based uh, manufacturers, I think is going to be really helpful and pay dividends on continuing to sustain the growth of their local communities. Why, why, do, you th- why do you think that they've chosen Georgia or this area? Georgia is a great place to do business. You know, we have... You're speaking from my heart. Yeah, I would really I'm say, it. yeah, <laughs> it's great. Um, we collaborate like no one else. Um, you know, I've done economic development in other regions, and I have nothing but love for them. But one thing I will say is, here it really is Team Georgia. Mm. You know, whether you talk with the state, a local community, your utility partner like Georgia Power, we all are working together. And you know, we have multiple utility partners on working the same project because we all understand that growing Georgia one community at a time helps the entire state. Mm-hmm. So collaboration. Yeah. I mean, yes. Then there's low cost of business, transportation, uh, talented workforce, all of those good things too. But that's the one thing I can just say shines above all is how quickly we can get things done because we talk to each other sure. and we're there to help one another. So not to throw shades at these other communities, but, you know, is it is it the culture that's here that has that allows that teamwork to happen? Or why why is it that, you know, there is more teamwork in this community versus any other one? Yeah, I think that. And maybe that goes back to that romantic idea I had of the South, that whole hospitality. Yeah. <laughs> Southern. Um, you know, you go into an area like a D.C. metro and it's super competitive or Silicon Valley is very tech based. So it's almost like those places have a niche. Sure. Um, where Georgia, you know, we understand what our top industries are and how to tr- um, manage those and help build those and support those really well. Um 
But we also, I mean, I guess we're just, we've got that Southern hospitality where we want to help our neighbors. We want to help the people that are coming in and welcome them to the community. Yeah. That's awesome. That sounds really cheesy saying it. No, but you're good. You're feel. good. <laughs> I, I have to ask, where, where do you yeah. get, where, where's the, your energy come from, right? Like, I, I feel like, you know, you have such uh, positive energy. Um, is there a, a source that you have? Is there something that you live by that gives that to you? Oh, that's a great question. I would have to say my energy for what I do comes from being able to see the impact it has on my neighbors, the mm. local community. Um, you know, while I do have an emphasis on small business and entrepreneurs with programs like Grow Georgia, you know, even having a big project land, you see that trickle effect because now that mom and pop coffee shop that I always loved and like maybe they were struggling during COVID. Well, now they've got a whole new company next door that is got to line coffee. out their door. Mm -hmm. So you get to see that really positive impact you have and bringing, you know, high paying jobs to a community because yes, you, that plant might support those high wages and that make those changes in someone's life forever. But that trickles down to the small businesses and my neighbors and, mm -hmm. you know, the people I see at the dog park. So I think it's really just helping people. Um, but, you know, there, there's there's a side of business that isn't always like, you know, sunshine and rainbows. Right. There's also, you know, as competition comes in, like such as um, these bigger box uh, retail shops, they start putting the mom and pops kind of like, you know, to the wayside. I guess like, how do we, how do we balance that? Because yes, there's, I definitely think that the selection has increased because like these retail stores are, are able to offer things at a lower cost, at a better like rate. But how do, how do these mom and pops compete? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think there's, I think that comes down to working a lot with your local community and finding ways that you can overcome those challenges. There's a way for a big box store and small business in a main street to both thrive. Mm -hmm. So if I were a small business opening up, I'd say, what is what is not being provided by that big box store? Uh -huh. Maybe it's something you can do differently for a customer experience mm -hmm. or something you can offer a product that they don't have. And then there's always those partnerships and collaboration opportunities. It's a lot harder for Oh, I shouldn't say like brand names. It's a lot, <laughs> I was trying it's to avoid that. Yeah, we'll, we'll edit that out. <laughs> we'll be fine. It's a lot harder for two big box stores to collaborate and come together. But if you've got four businesses on Main Street that are like, look, this is what we need to do to be competitive. Let's do an event together. Mm -hmm. Let's get a rewards program going. Um, what can we do differently? Because, you know, there's a lot of spending power out there. There's a lot of people looking for different experiences. And there's... I think I truly believe at the end of the day, people like supporting their small businesses. They mm -hmm. like knowing who they're buying from. So making sure that you're also using that to your advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, paint me a picture of what you view the future of Georgia to be. So one of the things I am really excited about, and I, I'm not going to be able to talk as eloquently as I'd like to about it. I'm still learning. Um, I really see this turn towards, um, you know, sustainability and and inclusion that it, it, it's just happening here. So you're seeing a lot more people that weren't brought into discussions previously and a lot of maybe um, environmental challenges or concerns that haven't, at least to my knowledge, you know, I, I don't, I've only been here 18, well, gosh, I've been in Georgia four years now. Okay. Um, and I think you're seeing this, this shift with our you know, you've got all these great tech workers coming or graduating from our universities. So I just see this, you know, we're, we're maybe in the South before I lived here. You, you didn't see it as a, a Silicon Valley. You didn't see it as a New York City. But you're seeing that type of, I'm not painting the best picture. I'm trying no, to like good. speak from my heart on this. No, you're good. So I'm, I'm just seeing um, a better South, if you will. And I'm, I know I'm stealing that tagline from somebody from a media <laughs> that I read. Um but I'm just really proud to see the growth in my own community of people coming together and tackling things like environmental equity, environmental justice, mm. tackling things like inclusion and um, making sure that people not only have a seat at the table, but uh, the ability to make decisions at that table as well. That's right. Uh, so these resources that you spoke about earlier, where do, where do we find them? Sure. So if you visit growgeorgia.com, you'll be able to connect with connect with networking opportunities um, throughout the state, funding, and it means everything from grants, loans, and venture capital that's focused on diverse founders. In addition to that, educational opportunities, 
supplier inclusion programs, and then my favorite part, the success stories. Fantastic. Well, uh, Vanessa, I have to thank you so much for coming onto the show. Uh, thanks for giving us kind of like an insight into the, all the things that Georgia Power is doing. Uh, you know, again, uh, one of the things I started off with is I didn't realize that Georgia Power had such an emphasis on entrepreneurship. Uh, the fact that they have a uh, dedicated uh, part of their business where they are helping uh, entrepreneurship because like you said, the more entrepreneurs here, the more businesses that they have the power. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Adam. Absolutely.